I want to minister on something uh, on the other end of the spectrum from uh, the, 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 the vision and the inspiration of this morning about being a part of history and not looking back and thinking, man, I wish I realized what we're a part of and, and missing it. And I'm going to move uh, something completely different tonight from John chapter 5. In, in 2017, there was a former school teacher named Jay Verdi who was diagnosed with a rare and incurable degenerative disease which slowly is turning her skin rock hard. Now, what this condition is all about is that basically it's encroached on every area of her life. As you can imagine, that her skin is slowly forming and, 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 and removing any flexibility or ability to, to, to function properly. The doctors have told her that eventually this disease is going to kill you. She said, my body is effectively turning itself into stone. I sometimes feel like I'm snapping when I go to reach out for things. The pain is shooting up my arms. It's always a reminder of what's happening inside of me. This woman is literally turning, or almost literally, turning into stone. Very slowly but surely, she's less able to move in her life. In the scripture that we're going to read tonight, we find a man who has stagnated and has not moved for 38 years of his life. Suddenly, Jesus comes along, challenges him to get up, does a miracle, and this man is set free from the cycle that he's been stuck in for so long. And how many know tonight, church, that this can happen to Christians that many Times, and I've observed this over many years now of, of pastoring, that Christians can, people can get right with God. And if you're a new believer in here tonight, or if you've maybe only just joined our church, perhaps, I really want you to pay attention tonight. Because one of the sad observations I've found over many years is that people can get powerfully, powerfully converted. They can get saved, they can be delivered, God can do miracles. They start so well. There are hopes, there are dreams, there are, there's passion. But after perhaps six months, perhaps a year, maybe a year and a half, but not usually longer than that, they very slowly but surely begin to move less. And before too long, they're either non-existent or they are stuck and barely existent in the things of God. And I want to minister tonight to the spiritually stagnant to help you be able to move forward in the things of God. Romans, John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1 tonight. And I need to uh, uh, move to my scripture because I was getting a bit worked up there and I forgot where I was. I have to read from the Bible as well. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethsaida, having five porches. Now in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went out down and, and, and uh, at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well after whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another one steps in before me. Jesus said, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day 
was the Sabbath. Let's consider tonight the spiritually stagnant. Let me look first of all with you, church, at turning to stone. In the scripture that we read tonight, this man is living in a place or a city of blessing. He is, uh, our text is set in a place of of God's presence and, and God's opportunity. He is in Jerusalem in the city of God. It is the center of God's promised land for his people. It is the holy land. And even to this day, pilgrims go there, people go there because they revere and they understand the history of the holiness of that place. This man is also, technically speaking, a child of God. He is a Jew, therefore God's chosen people. He has covenant rights. He has relationship that he can access that many Gentiles cannot access. The Bible says he is sitting by the pool of Bethsaida, which actually means the house of mercy or house of kindness. I mean, know tonight that that represents a picture of you and I, that that is what salvation is all about. When you become a Christian, uh, you enter into the place, to the promise, and to the presence of God. Can someone say amen? That life begins to change for you. Life begins to get better. Your soul becomes converted. There becomes a passion of life. And, and, and we realize that we're in a place of opportunity. We're in a place, man, where I can start again. It doesn't matter what I've done. Now I'm here. Life is going to work out okay. Richard, in his testimony a few months or last month, the, the baptism, he said, it's like I've been blind my whole life and now I can see. And I think that summarized the Christian life. You get saved. So, wow, what is this life that I haven't seen for so long? And it's in this place where God is moving. It's in the church. It's in the place of God where God is moving in our midst. So much begins, you get saved and suddenly, you know, the church is, if you like, the epicenter of what God is doing. There is spiritual activity going on. There is things going, taking place. There is enlargement. There is change. And and, and again, I'm going to keep saying it. There is lots of stuff going on. We just sent a new church into Dudley, amen. There's stuff going on here, amen. But in our scripture... This man is in the place of blessing, but he is not blessed. He is stagnant. There is movement, but he's staying still. You see, despite the place uh, that he's in, this man finds himself actually in a toxic environment. He's in the very place where God is at work in Jerusalem, yet this man is spiritually and emotionally absent. He had somehow, his life had grounded to a halt. He wasn't making any progress in the things of God. Verse 5, now was a certain man who had an infirmity for 38 years. And it's very possible as a Christian, after that initial period of doing well, that you come to a place where you get used to Christianity, you get used to the blessing, and you sit by a pool and you remain absent. You can become apathetic in the things of God, that your faith is just just there. Your service to God is really not a priority. Your attendance to church is no longer something that excites you, but you realize, oh, maybe I could not go tonight. You go through the motions, but there's no real heart for the things of God. You could see the greatest of preachers, They preach great revelation. God is moving. People are getting saved. And you walk out and there's not real any change. See, how does someone come to a place like this? In our scripture, there are four characteristics that this man had embraced and became. And I want you, as I go through these tonight, if, if, if there are any of these four evident in your life, it is very probable that you will soon become, if you haven't already, become stagnant. Number one is a focus upon self above others. This man was obsessed by himself. In the text, we find that it was all about himself and his sickness. He was surrounded by sick people, but you know, his need was the thing that he was consumed by. 
Salvation is often self-indulgent to start with. And I understand that. God's going to save me. God's going to help me. And, and that's how life begins as a Christian, as a new convert. But very quickly, if you stay that way, you are going to become stagnant. Because the Christian life is designed that my life is going to be a blessing for somebody else. My life is going to move forward and I am here to serve other people. If life, for, if Christianity for you is simply self-obsessed, very quickly you'll, you won't move forward. Second thing we find is that there is a reliance on others to solve his problems. Now again, I understand that we all need to be carried from time to time. You know the paralytic man in Mark chapter 2. He could not get to Jesus and he had four faith-filled strong friends who brought him to the place. They teared the roof off and he was healed because of his friends. But the man by the pool had been there for 38 years and the reason he gave is because nobody else is there to put me in the pool. He was looking for other people to be the solution for his healing. And that, my friend, is going to make you stagnant. Because if something goes wrong, then you can say, it's not my responsibility. He didn't lift me into the pool. He didn't help me learn how to pray. He didn't get me to be spiritual. That's why I'm at this place. And blaming or waiting for others to take responsibility for your healing is going to mean that you live a stagnant life. The third thing is there is a desire in him to find answers elsewhere. He didn't see any of the solutions that he was looking for. Uh, and so what does he do? He goes to the pool, which is not of God. You know what he says? I'm going to go to a different pool. I'm going to go to another church to find solutions. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to make money. I'm going to find leisure. I'm going to do something else. It's possible to turn to other doctrines. Many times people make doctrines because they want to accommodate the issues of their life rather than use the Bible to determine their life. They use their life to determine the Bible. If I'm not healed, then God can't be a healer. And therefore, they make a reason to say something is wrong with the Bible and to justify their life. And, and, and in this scripture, and this is what happens in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. They will collect teachers who will say what they want to hear because of their self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. You know, when the sermon in the church is merely just an opinion, I don't have to receive it. Ah, oh, it's just what he thinks. You start looking somewhere else for alternative opinions. This man was stagnant because he had started looking elsewhere other than from God. And the fourth issue is that we engage with toxic people. In this scripture, this man was surrounded by sick people. Now, how many know if you need to get healed, it's probably better to be around healthy people? This man had been there so long, he was surrounded by people who were like him. And I know that kind of scene. No doubt they were all moping. They were all full of self-pity. They were all complaining about how bad life is and how no one helps them. And they were all making themselves feel better about how bad they are. Verse 7 of our text, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. When it stirred up, when I am coming, another one steps in before me. He said, I can't deal with anything here. In his mind, others were the problem. They weren't helping him. And in fact, they were preventing him from moving forward. When you find yourself in an environment of fellowship that is full of complaints and troubles, God isn't helping me. Yeah, God didn't help me either. When there are people who are bad for you, it's going to produce an environment that causes you to be stagnant. So let me talk secondly then about two revelations. Because in this situation, when, you're stu when you are stagnant, I mean, actually the situation doesn't resolve itself. Time in this case was not going to make this man's life better. He had been there for 38 years. He had been thinking the same way for 38 years. He was saying the same things for 38 years. 
Many times we're mistaken and we say, you know what, I'm just going through a season and, and, and we assume that time is going to solve the problem. You know what, next year this is going to be, how many people have ever made a New Year's resolution Say next year this is going to be different? And it's exactly the same, right? Because the issue is not, ta- is, is not time, it's something inside of us. The problem is that when we become stagnant, actually we don't stay the same. Uh, someone, I remember someone told me many, many years ago that Christianity is like an uphill bike ride. If you stop pedaling, you're going to go backwards. The mistake we make is that we play down. It's okay the way I'm feeling right now. It's okay that I'm not doing the will of God right now. And we mistakenly uh, uh, allow it and therefore we continue to digress. So the solution in our scripture is to understand two revelations. And any new Christian here tonight, anyone who feels stagnant, please, please heed the words of this scripture. The first revelation to stop being stagnant is to understand that life is spiritual. It is only when this man turned to Jesus that things began to change. In other words, the issue was not his physical sickness. The issue had a spiritual root. And many times people will come and say, man, it's because of this circumstance that I can't serve God. Or man, it's because of that relationship that I'm struggling in my faith. Or I can't make prayer because of these things. But, but, but that's because we're looking at it as a physical issue. But I declare to you, friend, life is much more spiritual than you realize. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him laying there, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Jesus said, this physical thing is not the issue. That's a symptom. You need to contend spiritually. We understand that as Christians, we have an enemy that is against us. In Luke chapter 22, Peter is heading into a season where the devil was going to personally oppose him. And Peter was going to get stuck. Peter was going to throw it, potentially could have thrown it all in. I can't move. I'm under assault. What's going on? Peter didn't feel like coming to church. He didn't feel very spiritual. But Jesus said, listen to me, Peter, when you're going through those down moments, when you feel mentally unwell, when you are struggling in your prayer life, when you don't want to come to church and there's temptation before you, he said, Peter, listen clearly. Uh, Don't throw it in. It's not simply a physical issue. You you have to contend spiritually for the source of the problem. Verse 31 of Luke 22, Simon, Satan, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that you would not waver. Jesus said to overcome the stagnation of life, to, to overcome the troubles that you face, it is not simply an issue of what is going on and what you see. It is a spiritual issue. And that's why a Christian must learn to have a reflex into prayer, a reflex into seeking God, a reflex into a spiritual tenacity because you recognize something and say, you know what, I'm not putting up with this. You know what, I'm not happy with the way I am. I'm not happy with the way things are going. I'm not happy with the way this is. Devil, you're a liar. I'm coming against this. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. The Bible says the devil seeks to exhaust and wear out the saints. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. See, if He can grind you to a halt because of trouble, because of sickness, because of job and money, and all those things, you begin to neglect faith and stagnate. The solution, number one, the revelation, this is spiritual, and I need to engage spiritually with it. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, you have weapons that are for your victory. I don't know about you, but I've never really held real weapons. I had an uh, air rifle. Uh, I still have one. It's for my fox that comes into my garden sometimes. Don't tell anyone. And I uh, have a slingshot. That's also for the fox. Um, but I've never really held any real weapons. You know what? The Bible says you've got real weapons. You have weapons at your resource, but they're not things that you can see. 
The Bible says you have the sword of the Spirit, right? That would be really weird if you start walking down the street. You go to work tomorrow with a sword strapped to your side. That would be quite absurd. You'd get kicked out, right? You can't come into college today. Sorry. But the Bible says you do have a sword, and you've got to learn how to use it. You've got to learn how to take the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation. Church is not simply coming to church and being with nice people. Church is learning to be spiritual and engaging with life spiritually so that you can overcome the troubles that you're in. Second pillar of this man's life to overcome stagnation is to understand that you have a purpose. See, in our text, Jesus immediately gives this man a purpose. Verse 8, he said to him, rise and take up your bed and walk. Suddenly, this man had a reason to get up. Just think about that. He had been sitting there for 38 years. Where were you walking to? Well, actually, now I'm healed. I have a purpose in which I can live. I can achieve something. I can go somewhere. I can become someone. So many people, when they come to Christ, are so used to not being anyone. When they become a Christian, they just, and and they, they don't know what it means to be someone. But I declare to you today, God has called you to be someone new. He has called you to do something new. See, in his book, Rick Warren, he talks about the purpose driven life, and he asks the question, What on earth am I here for? And he understands the case that Jesus saved me for a purpose. And the job of every Christian is to find out what that purpose is and to achieve it before you get to heaven. Jesus had to address the issue in Peter's health because not only did he save Peter, he saw that Peter had a future and a a, a purpose for him. And later, Peter writes these words in 2 Peter 1, verse 5 and 10. For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to brotherly to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, they will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ. Therefore, brethren, even more diligently, make your election and sure, call sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. He's saying, you don't have to stay the same, and if you move forward, you're not going to trip up in the troubles of life. I tell you today, the will of God for all believers is not just to move away from your old life. It is to move towards and actively progress towards the new purpose-driven life that Jesus has for you. Maybe tonight you haven't ever asked this question, but what have you added to your faith in this last few months? What is, what is God bringing you into this year? Are you closer to Jesus today than you were in January? Is your prayer life changing? Do you have revelation? Do you have dominion over sins that you didn't have two years ago? Are you involved? Have you grown? You see, to have a purpose means there is an observable change in moving forward. When you were called by Jesus, he called you to do something, to become someone. First Chronicles 17, 7, thus says the Lord, I have taken you from the sheepfold, from following sheep to being ruler over my people. Said to David, you're not just kind of cleaning up sheep dung anymore. You're the ruler of my people. Maybe God would say to you, come out of the fields because there are things that I need you to pursue. Let me talk finally and quickly tonight about the miracle of change you see in our text tonight it's not only 
the will of God that's revealed, but actually it's the heart of God as well. Because in our scripture, it's very powerful that Jesus sought those out who were on the ground. The Bible says that his mission was to reach those who had become stuck. They had become stuck in sin. They had become stuck in captivity, stuck in their sickness. They were spiritually weak. We know the scripture in Luke chapter 4, how the Bible says, God has anointed me, amen, to, 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 uh, to heal the sick, amen, to set the captive free, to set at liberty those who are bound. What this man needed is not what he expected to happen. Jesus came to him on that day. He probably thought he would have recovered over time. He probably thought that, you know what, this is going to take a little while. I'll go to some kind of uh, walking rehab or something and learn to walk again. But the reality is that Jesus came to him and Jesus healed him instantly. Verse 9, and immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. I declare to you tonight that God, what God can do in your life can happen a lot faster than what you think it will. That sometimes you can be in the place of state stagnation and, and feel like life has lost its meaning. Worship doesn't mean anything. There's no real reason to be in the house of God. Yet God can make that change and, and bring a redemption in a few moments time. We know that within a period of 50 days, Peter went from denying Christ to leading a church in revival. 50 days. There was a man in Pastor Tom Payne's church in Australia at the time. And uh, he, for many years, had been in the church and he was always sitting on the back row. And, and he was unresponsive. He was not involved. He wouldn't ever answer an altar call. He was just sitting there. One day there was a challenge for world evangelism, for people to become missionaries. And this man, for one reason or another, responded to the altar. He gave, as Isaiah, I, here I am, Lord, send me. Within one year, this man was sent into Indonesia as a missionary with his wife, of course. How, do you, how does that happen? Because it's not a pro, it's a miracle. Because it's when you surrender, God, I'm fed up of being stuck. I don't want to live this absent, stagnating Christianity. Life is, I'm going to engage with life spiritually. And I'm going to follow the purpose that you have given me. The trigger for effective Christianity, as I close, was this man's obedience. You know, obedience is the observable evidence that we have faith. James says that faith without works is dead. You say you have faith and I know, but, but, but how do we know that? By the obedience or the works that you have. Many times we're looking for some new revelation, for some kind of voice from heaven, for some kind of, uh, you know, you, you, uh, God's direction in some way. But you know what happens? Jesus comes to this man and he just says, get up. Jesus says, move forward. That's enough. Go and do something. I mean, that's not new revelation. That's not profound revelation from heaven. He was expecting uh, the, the heavens to part. He was expecting a voice, the earth to shake, the, the hand to come out of the sky. And Jesus says, get up. Stop sitting there and move forward. Perhaps you're here today and you recognize that you are stagnant. Could Jesus come to you and tell you to take up your bed and walk? Could Jesus tell you to step out of your comfort zone, to engage spiritually with him, to fulfill your purpose? Are you entering into all that God has for you? Are you picking up your bed? Are you moving forward? Because that's the will of God. And when you do, you find the miracle of change that you're looking for. You know, why don't we have every head bowed, every eye closed? We want to pray. You know, perhaps you're here tonight and you need a miracle of God.
Uh, we want to believe God this evening, amen, for breakthrough. We want to pray. Amen. Perhaps you're here tonight and, and you need, first of all, salvation. You're not right with God. Perhaps you have been backslidden for many years or, 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 or you just recognize you're living in sin. And we need to be forgiven. You need to get right. If you were to die today, you wouldn't make heaven your home. And that bothers you. The good news is you can be forgiven. You can be set free if you would come to Christ today. Very quickly, you're here. You want to get right with God. Would you lift up your hand to signify you want to pray? You want to get right? You want to be forgiven? You need to repent. You're living in sin. Would you lift up your hand? God is knocking. I see that hand. Thank you for your honesty. Anybody else you want to get right with God? I'll pray with you in a few moments' time. You want to join this honest heart. You need to get right. I see that hand. Anybody else? Would you lift up your hand? And the two people that lifted their hands, would you look up at them? You both meant that. You want to receive Jesus. You want to follow Christ and do right. Amen. Amen. Would you come forward? We're going to have two people from the church pray with you. And uh, Amen. Amen. Chip, you can come. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I talked tonight about spiritual stagnation. And I know that it's possible for older Christians to be spiritually stagnant. And maybe you recognize that tonight. You say, man, I need to begin to pursue what God has for me. But what's on my heart tonight is those who are new in the faith, those that are new Christians, those that are new to the things of God here. And you wouldn't get ripped off by the enemy. Sometimes it just becomes a phase because you move on and life gets a bit boring and predictable in church and so something else takes your attention. But you, you know what? That's spiritual. The devil is ripping you off of what God has for your future. Maybe tonight you recognize, you know what? I'm not going to be like those before me, but I'm going to do the will of God for the rest of my life. The solution is twofold. Life, the pillars, is that life is spiritual and in, learn to engage spiritually. Learn to take up your armor every single day. Not just go to church on Sunday, but take up your armor every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Life is spiritual. I'm praying. I'm overcoming these problems with God. I'm seeking the Lord. Revelation, reading scripture, becoming spiritually mature. And the second pillar is to recognize the purpose that God has. First of all, you are called to discover the purpose. Second of all, you are called to pursue that purpose. Maybe you recognize you've been spiritually stagnant. You've been around uh, 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 the wrong type of people. You've been expecting others to solve your problem for you. And you say, you know what? This isn't right. I need to move from where I am so I can pursue the will of God. These altars are open. Why don't you come and find a place to pray tonight? God, I give you glory and I thank you. Jesus, I